please give. That would be wonderful. And have a part in a love offering for our guest preacher. And uh, that will take place at the end of the service. So, Jeremiah chapter number 20. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say oh me. Uh huh, uh huh, and uh, preachers' wives and kids and uh, preachers and uh, and uh, other other f- uh, men from other <laughs> churches. Uh, I was going to say, what are you? A song leader, a deacon, a usher, a, um, a lost sinner that needs to be saved? I mean, whatever. All right, here we go. Jeremiah chapter number twenty, and uh, we're going to start reading in verse number seven. Go down to verse number thirteen. Let's read that together. I'll read it out loud. You follow along as I read. O oh, Lord. Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and seest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evil doers. I want to speak to you this evening on this to- topic from uh, verse number, let's see here, verse number nine. That's going to be my main focus. It says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing. And the last five words are the title of my message, And I Could Not stay. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you, dear Lord, and I am so grateful for your goodness and grace and love towards us. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for each and every preacher that came, all the different folks from different churches who've come. Thank you, Lord, for those who are members of Hopewell Baptist Church who are here. And then, Lord, thank you for those who are watching online tonight. Now, Father, please meet with us in a very real way. We thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you do. Holy Spirit, give me your power. Dear Lord, also give me the mind of Christ. I pray that you'll touch every heart and change every life, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah wanted to quit. In verse number, uh, let's see here, in the very first verse that we read, he was complaining to the Lord. He said, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Every one mocketh me. And then he reflected about his preaching. He said, for since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. And then like many Christians and even many preachers through all these years, he said these familiar words in verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. You see, Jeremiah was going through a really difficult time in his life. The fight was too hard. The fight was too long. And the fight was too painful. 
And he got to the point where he said, boy, when I signed up for the ministry, when God called me to be a prophet, and he asked me to go preach unto the people of God and the children of Israel, he said, I felt like I was going to be there to preach and to lead our people into the ways of God and into salvation and in deliverance from our enemies, and it never turned out that way. The Bible refers to Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. And the reason he was the weeping prophet was because of the sad condition of the children of Israel, because of how they were desolate and depraved of the blessing of God and how they were in a constant state of apostasy and going in the wrong direction. And I'm sure Jeremiah thought in his heart, I'm going to preach the word of God. They're going to listen to me. They're going to receive what I have to say. They're going to get right with God. We're going to have national revival and we're going to have the blessing of God on the beloved city Jerusalem like days of old. I'm sure Jeremiah had great intentions. I'm sure that he loved the Lord. I'm sure that he loved the people that he was preaching to, but he was in a battle. He was in a fight. And like I said, in his mind, it was simply too hard. In his mind, the battle was too long. In his mind, the battle was too painful. He preached but the people would not listen. And in fact, instead of getting right with God, instead of walking down the aisle and praying at the altar, they persecuted him instead. And he said, I'm done. He said, I'm not going to make mention of him anymore. I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. And there's another preacher, another prophet, who was also in a similar state. Look over at 1 Kings chapter 18, please. A familiar passage of Scripture to most of us that have been in church for years. Those of you that have not been in church for years, this might be new to you. We're going to read a lot of verses right now. So we're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 18, and, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 30. And I'd like you to just follow along with me as I read out loud. This is only the second passage that we'll be referring to for the length of my sermon. So uh, we'll go back to uh, Jeremiah once we're done reading 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to go into chapter 19 as well. 1 Kings chapter 18, and look down if you would please at verse number 30. The Bible says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measure of seed. And he put the wood in order. And cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, then Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. 
And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, before we go to chapter 19, Man, what an incredible revival. The children of Israel were tossed in, in, in their hearts between, halted between two opinions. Is the Lord God or is Baal God? And they had over 450 false prophets of Baal. And they were worshiping Baal. And then they were still trying to believe in the Lord. And Elijah came and said to the children of Israel, how long halt you between two opinions? You need to decide. Either the Lord's God or or Baal, but pick one. And so he said, let's have a challenge. Let's get the prophets of Baal together and let them have a sacrifice and let them cry out to Baal and then I'll have a sacrifice and I'll cry out to the Lord God and we'll see who answers by fire and the God that answers by fire will be the God of Israel. And all the people said, Amen. Let's do it. And so uh, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, go for it. You go first. I'll let you have first chance. And so from the morning until the afternoon and all the way until the evening sacrifice, they cried out to Baal, but Baal was nowhere to be found. There was no fire that fell from heaven. There was nothing, no answer at all. They started cutting themselves, thinking, my God will answer if I cut myself. And they were cutting themselves, letting their own blood run out upon the altar. They said, well, maybe Baal will answer if we kick over the sacrifice of the Lord from Elijah. So they went and they kicked it over and tried to destroy it. And they said, Baal, please answer. You know why he didn't answer? Because he's not real. He's not real. And they cried out for hours. And by the time it got close to the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah said, listen, fellas, it's my turn now. And he came to the altar and he repaired it. And he said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour water on my sacrifice on the altar. So get four buckets of water and just pour it over the animal sacrifice and all over the altar, and they did. He said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. They, he said, let's, let's do it a third time. Go get four more uh, buckets of water. Pour it all over there. And, they, and it was just soaked and absolutely drenched. And then there was a trench that was around the altar. And he said, why don't, you, why don't you fill up that trench with water too? And let's see what happens, right? Anybody here understand that water is not good to get, to get a fire. <laughs> I mean, water does not ignite fire. Water puts out fire. But I thank God that Elijah wanted to show the people of God that there's nothing that our Lord cannot do. His fire from heaven was going to take care of that water, no problem whatsoever. And so here's the prophets of Baal. They prayed, and they cried out for hours for their God to answer by fire, and he didn't. Elijah came up with a 63-word prayer. Maybe took him 60 seconds, maybe, maybe a minute and a half. And he prayed and cried out, and fire fell down from heaven. It consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the wood. It consumed the stones. It consumed the dust, and it licked up the water. And all the people said, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said, take those prophets of Baal and, and slay them. And that's what the law of the land was. A false prophet was to be put to death. So he wasn't being a vigilante. He was just obeying uh, the books of Moses, Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. And, uh, and so they did. And then they were in a severe drought for years. It had not rained in Israel for years. And then Elijah said, yeah, in, in verse 41, he told Ahab, get up drink the sound of the abundance of rain is coming and he said what are you talking about hasn't rained for years here we're in a severe drought he said it's coming he went up on mount carmel and he bowed his head and he prayed and told his servant go look over the sea and he said i saw nothing goes do it seven times on the seventh time he said i saw this cloud above the sea in about the size of a man's hand and he says you better go tell ahab get down from this mountain and get as fast as you can to your home because the rain's coming unless it stops you and, uh, and the rain fell. I mean, what an awesome revival. God showed himself strong to Israel. God showed himself kind to his man, Elijah. I mean, what a great revival. And then all of a sudden comes chapter 19. Look at verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. 
And with all, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Oh, by the way, who were those 450 prophets of Baal? They were Jezebel's prophets. That was her preachers. That's, that's who they were. And they have come and said, honey, you won't believe what Elijah, the man of God, did. And he told her everything. And he said, oh, by the way, all of your favorite preachers are no longer going to be on the television set. You won't be able to watch them on the Internet. They're all dead. And look what it says in verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She was saying, Bud, you got 24 hours to live. I'm coming after you. Now, this is one woman. This is like, well, should I say it? Like Hillary Clinton coming after you. I mean, that's a scary thought right now. I'm telling you, man alive. But Elijah took on those 450 false prophets of Baal, and this one woman, Jezebel, says, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. In verse 3, <laughs> when he saw that, talking about Elijah, he arose and went for his life. He came to Beersheba, which, he, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey. That's 24 hours, by the way. That's the time that he was supposed to be dead by Jezebel. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. You know, by the way, you know, you know how moms go in and wake the children up, time to get up. Honey, honey, sweetheart, it's time to get out of bed. Would you get up? We got to go to school. That's how, that's how moms wake up their children. This angel was not his mother. I can imagine he woke him up like a father wakes up their child. Hey, son, get out of bed, man. It's time to get up. What do you think it is? It's time to get up. What are you doing? I'm sure it, when it says he touched him, it wasn't like a, hey, 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 Elijah. No, he probably slapped him on the side. That's what I would have done. And it says he, he um, uh, uh, woke him up. And it, watch what it says in verse 5. And as he lay, he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, then the angel touched him and said, and him arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him, said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Forty days and forty nights he traveled, and it, it indicates he never ate again. He went on the strength of those two meals, for forty days and forty nights. In verse nine it says, "And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah?" And he said, "I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts." For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I don't remember that exactly being the case in chapter 18. I thought there was a great revival. I thought they slew the false prophets of Baal. I thought there was an abundance of rain, and the drought was over, and he had one woman coming after him. And that's how he responded. Look what it says in verse 11. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great, strong, great and strong wind rent the mountains and break it in pieces, uh, break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know what God was doing? He was giving Elijah a second chance at answering him. He said, Now, why are you here, Elijah? 
And again, Elijah said in verse 14, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. When thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimeholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You see, Elijah, like Jeremiah, and by the way, <laughs> what a great prophet in the Old Testament. I mean, I cannot think of a better prophet than Elijah. I mean, God bragged on Elijah a lot, and he was a great prophet of God, but he wanted to quit. He was so discouraged because one woman, one powerful woman, but one woman said, I'm going to kill you in the next 24 hours. And he just felt like that was it. I can't take it anymore. He went out on a day's journey, told his servant, stay here. I'm going on further. And he said, I'm just going to wish to die. God, just kill me. I'm tired of this. Everybody's against me. Nobody loves me. I think I'm going to eat some worms and just simply die. And he just wanted to die. And God came, sent an angel, slapped him on the side, said, get up and eat, man. What in the world are you doing? He got up and ate, went back to sleep for the rest of the day. The next day came, he said, man, get up and eat, man. What in the world are you doing? That's all in the Hebrew. That's how the angel spoke to him. That's how I know it. And, uh, and uh, he said, get up, eat. You got a long journey going ahead. And you need this, this, the strength of this food to eat uh, to be able to make it. And so he did. And then God came to him and said, look, son, what in the world are you talking about? They all hate everybody that, that stands for me. You're going to die. Everything's horrible. Do you know something, Elijah? I've got 7,000 who have not bowed the knee uh, to Baal and kissed, him, kissed his hand. He goes, I've got it under control. Now, you get back there and get to work. And that's exactly what Elijah did. But Elijah, as great as a man of God as he was, he wanted to quit when the battle got tough. Jeremiah, as great as a man of God as he was, he wanted to quit. And look what it says. It says in verse number 9 of Jeremiah chapter 20. Go back there and we're going to finish our sermon with this passage here. In verse number 9 he said, Then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak anymore in his name. And then here's what happened. He said, But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Listen to this carefully. When I was in Bible college, I graduated from Hiles Anderson College in 1991. I, I started out with a freshman class of approximately 800 students. When it came time to graduate, four years later, we had a graduating class of approximately 200 students. 75% of the students, again, approximately, did not finish. While I was there, God taught me a whole lot. I, I, I loved my days at Hiles Anderson College. I went to Hiles Anderson College because God sent me there, but I wanted to learn from one person and one main person that was Dr. Jack Hiles. And I was so thrilled and honored to be able to learn and sit at the feet of, in my opinion, the greatest pastor on American soil in our generation. And I thank God for that, that time. But while I was there, I paid attention and I observed some things among the student body. And what I observed by the time I graduated was this. There were two main flows of thought that were present amongst the students at Howes Henderson College. The first main flow of thought was find a way to get the job done. Find a way to get the job done. That was the first main flow of thought. I happened to have a division leader that he was the elite division leader of all 14 divisions of the bus ministry at Howes Henderson College. And I heard him preach that sermon time after time after time after time. Find a way. 
to get the job done. Don't give me excuses. Find a way to get the job done. Don't let obstacles stop you. Find a way to get the job done. Don't let the devil discourage you and tell you you can't do anything for God. You find a way to get the job done. You just go at it and go at it and go at it and don't you settle for failure. Don't you settle for defeat. You find a way to get the job done. That was the first flow of thought that was amongst the students at Howes Anderson College. I'd like to say that was among the minority. The minority of the students felt that way. The second flow of thought that was present at Howes Anderson College amongst the student bodies while I was there was this. Do what you can and see what happens. Do what you can and see what happens. The overwhelming majority of the students in the student body, they lived with this motto. May they, they may not have said it out loud, but they lived it and they, they practiced it. Just do what you can. What happens, happens. That's what the 75% of those who didn't graduate after they started basically felt. Well, we came, we tried, didn't work out, didn't graduate, it's all okay, we, we did our best, it didn't work out, let's go home. And that's what their philosophy was. Do what you can and see what happens. They'd have a big day and they would say, well, let's just do what we can and see what happens. They would have their goals and their, their, their challenges and their, and their pursuits and they would be like, well, just do what you can. What happens is going to happen. I refuse to be a part of that flow of life. I refuse to be a part of that ideology and that thinking. I am not going to live my life, bless God, and simply do what I can and then just see what happens. I'm not going to live that way. When I was at Howes Anderson College, I learned this valuable principle, find a way to get the job done. That's what you got to do. God gives you a job. He gives you a task. He wants you to do something for him. No excuses, no retreat, no regrets, no failure, no quitting, no stopping you just find a way to get the job done you see I'm under the impression that God would never ask you to do something that you could not do he would never come to you and say I want you to obey me and then not know, knowing that there's no way that you can obey him I know that God would not say to you this is God's will for your life knowing that you can never do it no I'm telling you something if God has given you a job if God's word has spoken to your heart and there's something the Holy Spirit has led you to do don't you just go out there and say, well, I'll just do what I can and find a, and see what happens. No, you find a way to get the job done. All throughout these 35 years later, I dedicated my life to God in the summer of 1987. At 17 years of age, June 14, 1987, I walked down the aisle at Hopewell Baptist Church in Napa, California, and I surrendered to the ministry. I said, God has called me to preach. The week before that, June 7th, 1987, I walked the aisle and I said to my pastor, God's called me to preach. He looked at me and he said, are you sure? Are you sure? And I said, well, I thought so a minute ago. <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, I wrote a book called Called to Preach. He goes, I'm going to give it to you after the service. You go home and you read the first chapter. Come back next week. If you still feel God wants you to preach, you let me know. I said, all right. So I took his book, called to preach. Went home, read the first chapter and the second and the third, all the way down to the end. I came back next Sunday and he said, well, what do you, what do you decide? I said, God's called me to preach. He goes, all right, make it public and, uh, and, uh, and surrender to the ministry. So I said, yes, sir. And uh, when I surrendered on June 14th, 1987, Corey Sulian has come, I'm sorry, Pastor Corey Sulian has come to the altar. <laughs> surrendering to the ministry. He's going to be a preacher. I do not remember one clap. I do not remember one amen. I don't remember at all. People coming down to the altar when the service is over congratulating me before they left the church. Oftentimes when people would get saved and baptized, my home pastor would have those who got saved and those who got baptized standing at the front of the pulpit at the altar and then people would come by and congratulate him and everything. I don't think one person shook my hand. All I remember was the week before. Are you sure? And so God called me and I went to Hiles Anderson College and I learned find a way 
to get the job done. You see, I don't think God made a mistake when he called me to preach when I was 17 years of age. I don't think it was wrong for me to get into the ministry. When I went to Howes Anderson College, I went with the intent to graduate. I went with the intent to learn whatever Jack Hiles and Howes Anderson College was meant to give me to train me to become a preacher, to become a pastor. When I was at Howes Anderson College, I never thought a church pulpit committee would ever call me to be their pastor. So I just said, I guess God wants me to start a church. I remember the day I was sitting in the pews at, Howes Anderson, at First Baptist Church of Hammond. I had graduated. And um, and uh, I was I was now just waiting to get my MRS degree, my missus, and uh, and I was sitting there in the pews, and um, and Dr. Howe stood up and said, "You men that are." Actually, this was after we got married. We'd gotten married. My wife was still uh, waiting to graduate, and it was just a just a, a little bit of time she was going to graduate. He said, "You men that are 25 years of age of age and older, if God's called you to preach." And no pulpit committee has contacted you to come candidate in their church. What are you waiting for? Just get out here and somewhere in the world and go start you a church. I was 24 years of age. And I remember that night clearly. That's the night that Hopewell Baptist Church was birthed in my heart of Longmont, Colorado. That was the night that God told me to go to Longmont, Colorado in my heart. I didn't know it then, but he told me, you're going to go to Longmont, Colorado and start a church. Over the process of that next year, I met with Dr. Hiles. I, my wife graduated. In the summer of 1994, we came to Longmont, Colorado. Didn't know a single soul here. Not a single person. But God used those early days to lay the foundation for Hopewell Baptist Church. This coming September, I'll be celebrating our 28th anniversary for 35 years since I have walked the aisle to surrender to be a preacher. I have lived with a philosophy, find a way to get the job done. Now listen to me carefully. I, like Jeremiah, have gone through some hard times. I, like Elijah, have had some times thinking, they're not wanting to listen. The church isn't growing like, like I thought it would. Brother Domley, when I came to, to Longmont, Colorado in 1994, I thought after a couple of years we'd be running four or five hundred. After five years, we'd be running 1,000. After 10 years, we'd have a Bible college. After 28 years, which is what we are right now, we'd be the largest church in the state of Colorado and on our way to becoming the largest church in the, in the United States of America. That's what I thought. 28 years later, hasn't really turned out that way. 28 years later, we've led hundreds and thousands upon thousands of people to Christ. Our church is not running thousands, but yet, I have felt like Elijah felt when he said, they're not listening. They're wanting to kill me. They don't want to come to church. They're not wanting to tithe. I'm, I'm, I'm laboring and I'm giving of myself and I'm doing all that I can and they're just not responding. I think about Jeremiah when he said in verse number 10, he said, for I heard the defaming of many. That's defaming of him, by the way. Fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. They were mocking him. Yeah, tell us what's going to happen, and we'll spread the word too. All my familiars, that would be his loved ones. That would be his friends. That would be those whom he was close to. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, peradventure, he will be, uh, be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. All of that happened to Jeremiah. He wanted to quit. He just said, Lord, put a fork in it, and I'm done. That's all in the Hebrew, by the way. He said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Now, those of you that are in the ministry you know that life is hard. Those of you that are in the ministry, you know the devil is real. If you've been in the ministry for any length of time, you understand the spiritual warfare that takes place when a man of God tries to lead a people of God to engage in the kingdom of God. You understand, and it could be very hard. It could be very discouraging. Like Jeremiah, it could be painful. Like Jeremiah, it could go on and on and on and be long. Like Jeremiah, it can feel like it's simply too hard. But Jeremiah did one thing, and this is what I'd like to focus on right now. 
He said in verse 9, but his word, that's the word of God, by the way, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He was saying, I've got the word of God in my heart, and it's not letting me be. I want to quit. I want to give up. I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want to make any mention of his name anymore. I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. It's too much. The battle's too hard. The battle's too long. It's too painful. I'm done. But he had spent years learning the word of God. And that word was in his heart. And it was burning. And it was burning. And he finally said, I want to quit but I can't. The word of God won't let me quit. There's still more that I can do. And then look what it says in verse number 11. It says, but the Lord is with me. <laughs> Wait a second. In verse number seven, Jeremiah said, oh Lord, thou hast deceived me. And then all of a sudden, after the word of God was burning in his heart and he was meditating on it and he was weary with forbearing, he says, I can't stop it anymore. I can't stay. I've got to preach his word. All of a sudden, his tune changed. All of a sudden, he said, but the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, now he's getting confidence. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And then he said, but O Lord of hosts that triest the righteous and seest the, uh, ra thy, the, the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. And then here's the last verse that we read. Now, instead of getting angry at God and accusing God and wanting to quit, look what he does in verse 13. Sing unto the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. For he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. How in the world did Jeremiah's attitude change from what it was in verse 9? I will not make mention of him nor speak anymore in his name to him saying, The Lord is with me. He's a mighty terrible one. I'm going to sing unto the Lord. I'm going to praise his name. It was all because of the word of God. You listen to me. When you feel like quitting, you just start reading the Bible. When you feel like giving up, just start listening to Bible preaching. When you feel like throwing in the towel, you just get your Bible and you read it and you read it. Turn off your television set. Turn off Facebook and get your face in the book. Turn off social media and you just let the word of God come into your heart and burn and light a fire so that you can't stay. And I promise you, you're going to change your tune. I got five things to say tonight. Number one. I will not give the devil satisfaction of winning over me. I will not do it. I will not do it. You know why I won't quit tonight? Because the devil would be happy if I did. You know why I'm not going to stop preaching the word of God tonight? Because that's what the devil wants. You want to know why I'm not going to stop being a daily soul winner? Why today I went out soul winning and why tomorrow I'm going to go and while Wednesday I'm going to go? I'm going to tell you exactly why. Because the devil doesn't want anybody else to get saved. And I want to just simply make him mad. I am not going to give the devil satisfaction of winning over me just because the battle's tough, just because it's hard, just because it's long, just because my heart has broken time and time again, just because I've shed tears and my wife has shed tears in recent days just because the devil is on my tail I am not going to give him satisfaction of winning over me number two I will not forget how God spoke to me while training for the ministry I will not forget it I'm not going to forget it I remember sitting in the pews brother Donnelly at Howes Anderson College and I remember one of the faculty members was saying John chapter 14, verse number 12, I believe it is. He taught the lesson that Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. He said, the works that I do, you're going to do them. And greater works than these shall ye do. I remember sitting in the pews at Howes Anderson College, listening to all those sermons and listening to all those lessons and lectures and how the word of God, man, he just burned in me. And he said, you can do something great in your life. You can go out there, wherever God sends you, and you can build a great ministry. You can do something special for the Lord. I remember how God has spoken to me. And after all these years, Brother Domily, I've not forgotten what, what, what God said to me. 
And I'm not going to forget what God said to me. I'm telling you something right now. When God called me to preach, he did not make a mistake. When God called me to preach and he put an idea in my heart about what the ministry that I can have, I don't know how it's all going to unfold. I know God gives the increase, but I'm just not going to forget. I didn't start this ministry. I didn't start to be a pastor just to be an average pastor. I didn't start this church just to be like every other church in town. I didn't start this church just to exist. I started this church so that we can change the world for the cause of Christ. And I'm not going to forget that. I'm not going to forget that. The devil wants me to forget it. He wants me to tell, he tells me, oh, that's just a childish dream. Oh, that was just an immature thought. That was just you being fancy and dreaming, thinking of what could be that never will be. No, I'm not going to forget what God spoke to me in my training days at Howells Anderson College. Number three, when I, when discouraged, I'm going to meditate on God's word. When discouraged, I'm going to meditate on God's word. By the way, woe be to the person that discourages their pastor. You don't want to be the cause of discouraging your pastor. You, you don't know how much you need your pastor. And I'm not just talking about the members of Hopewell Baptist Church. I'm talking about these other pastors that are here. Brother Domile has a church. He's a pastor. I'm telling you something. Men of God, are sh uh, there's a short supply of them. And the ones that stand for the truth, the ones that preach the word of God, the ones that go soul winning, they are getting rarer and rarer as the days go by. I'm telling you something. If you've got a man of God that loves you and preaches the word of God and wins souls to Christ, you don't want to discourage encourage them you want to encourage them but yet the devil wants me discouraged I'd be lying tonight if I said to you I don't get discouraged I do discouragement comes just like it did to me just like it did to Elijah I'm no better of a man of God than Elijah was discouragement comes to me like it did to Jeremiah I'm gonna tell you this right now I'm no better than Jeremiah he was a much better preacher much better prophet endured much more pain and suffering than I've ever had to endure but I'm gonna tell you something like them discouragement has come to me and I'm gonna tell you this when discouraged I will meditate on God's word number four I will never let my fire go out. I will never let my fire go out. I said, I will never let my fire go out. Jeremiah said, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. You listen to me. You don't have to let the fire of God go out in your heart. You don't have to become cold and disinterested and, and fallen asleep in church. And, and who cares if people get saved and get baptized at church? You don't have to be that way. You can fan the flame. You can let the fire of the Word of God burn brightly if you want. You don't have to pour water on it and let it get extinguished. Let the fire of God stay burning brightly. Listen, I am just as passionate today about my preaching as I was when I started this church 20, when I was aged 25, 28 years ago. I am just as excited today winning souls to Christ as I was the first soul I led to Christ in, July, in August, uh, July of 1987. I am just as excited at the prayers that get answered when I pray today as I was when I first found out that God answers prayer. Listen to me. I am never, 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 never going to let my fire go out. Put, take me out in this alley out here and beat me with a two-by-four if I ever just go through the motions at Hopewell Baptist Church. I just simply exist. Just simply go. I'm not letting the fire go out. Number five and last. I am determined to make a difference for the kingdom of God. I am determined to make a difference for the kingdom of God. You know what God said to Elijah? He said, get up, man. Stop whining. Stop complaining. He said, Stop listening to CNN. That's in the Hebrew. I keep telling you, I know my Bible. He says, get off the television set. Get off of social media. You know what social media is? Social media can be good or can be bad. I try to limit my time on social media. I probably spend a little bit too much time on it. But there's so much negativity out there. And God was saying to Elijah, stop listening to all that negativity. You think you're the only one? You think everybody else is dead? You think you're the sole survivor of the things of God? He says, I'll tell you something, Elijah. There are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. He says, you're listening to the wrong source. 
He said, stop letting yourself get discouraged. Stop listening to the wrong source. And he says, I got a job for you to do. You go back and you anoint this person to be king. You anoint this person to be king. And by the way, you come to Elisha and you anoint him. He's going to be a prophet in your stead when it's time for you to go. And by the way, there's no record of Elijah ever getting discouraged again. Not till the day that God called him home in the chariot of fire. And Elisha saw it, and the mantle fell, and he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, and he got it. You listen to me right now. Listen to me. You get yourself some conviction. You get yourself some principles like I've stated to you tonight. I know the battle's tough. Good night, man. If it was easy, everybody would do it. If it was easy, everybody would be a pastor. If it was easy, everybody would be a daily soul winner. I understand the battle's tough. I know this. The devil is my enemy, not you. The devil is my enemy, not my family. The devil is my enemy, not any church members. The devil is my enemy, not any preachers across the country that criticize me for my daily soul winning. They're not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I am putting him on notice. I am making a public declaration. By the way, I've been in it for 28 years, so it's not like I'm just a, a fresh green preacher trying to uh, run my mouth without having anything to back it up. 28 years I've been the pastor of this church. I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. I don't plan on quitting. I don't plan on going away. I don't plan on giving up. I will, give the, I will not give the devil satisfaction of winning over me. I will not forget how God spoke to me while training in the ministry. When discouraged, I'm going to meditate on God's word. I will never let my fire go out. And I am determined from now till the day I die to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Why don't you learn from Elijah? Why don't you learn from Jeremiah? And if you'll let me, why don't you learn something from me tonight? And you stick it out. And I could not stay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for each and every person who came to church tonight. Thank you for each person who watched online. Father, please do a work in our midst now during this invitation. Dear God, I pray that somebody was encouraged tonight. I know the battles are tough. I know that the devil fights so hard. I understand that. But why in the world would we give him the satisfaction of winning why in the world would we let anybody, anybody die and go to hell just because our heart's broken? Why? Oh, God, let's do what Jeremiah did. Let's let the word of the Lord burn in our hearts so that we can't stay. Let's do what Elijah did and listen to the still, small voice of God and just simply say, okay, God, I'm going to keep in the fight. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to do what you want. Oh, dear God, revive us on this first night of our soul winning clinic. Let something special happen right off the bat. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. If God spoke to your heart tonight, would you please let God have his way in your life? Let's all stand.